Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Everett, and along with my wife, Michelle Everett, we are the host of God's Kingdom, where we discover in the Word of God that we are a chosen generation, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and a special treasure unto our God. Recently, we were able to minister in Forest City, North Carolina, at Epicenter Church with Pastors Joe and Lynette Dutton. And we ministered for two days on kingdom eschatology. Now, you may be asking, what exactly is that word eschatology? Well, we're talking about end time things and also the future reign and rule of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm inviting you right now, tune in with us as we go into kingdom eschatology. And you see here that Daniel places a premium on reading Jeremiah. And the Holy Ghost at this time unlocks something for him. Because if he hadn't have been reading, do you think the Holy Ghost, other than just a supernatural endowment, would have had anything to work with? You're afraid to answer that question, aren't you? <laughs> no, see, you got to give God something to work with. That's why the Bible tells us, study. To show thyself what? Approved. Get into the word. Get into the word. We see him in the word here. So whatever comes forth, we're going to see connected to the word. What did Jeremiah say that he had discovered? that there would be an accomplishment of 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Did that happen? When did Jeremiah say this? You see, you could go back actually and look at the beginning of this in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 through 14. You see the reasoning behind this, these 70 years. They have been disobedient. They have been noncompliant. The Lord has spoken to them, said, listen, you're going to have to not only hear my voice, but you're going to have to keep my commandments. That's going to be the thing that's going to stabilize you in the land. You read through much of the Old Testament history, and you'll find out that they were anything but that. They were noncompliant. <laughs> they, they refused many times, even after hearing his voice, to be obedient to that voice, and it ultimately cost them. All right. So you see that in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 through 14. And then it's repeated again in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 through 14. And, and I want you to grab that one because that, that really is a good one. And within this particular passage, there's a scripture that's quoted real often in the modern church. But see what Jeremiah said in chapter 29, verse 10, he said, For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. So notice the premise of this is that they're in captivity. He said, I will perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. And then this is where contextually verse 11 fits. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And we sing that song. How often do we connect it to people coming out of captivity? 
We usually don't. But they were going to be in captivity how long? Now listen carefully to me. Once they returned, his intent was to fully restore them and not remind them over and over and over and over. Yeah, you blew it. I had to throw you out of here. But now you're back. And now you got to behave like little stepchildren. Because I, I want you to always remember, you blew it. Uh -huh. Listen, listen, listen. God only has a plan A. Even if he has to temporarily stall it. When you return, when you return. You see, if you study Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30, same thing. Everything he said to them in going in, he said now, because between Deuteronomy 28 and about verse uh, 10 or 11 or so down to 14, he cast the vision. And then he tells them, now, if you mess up, these are your consequences. And then in chapter 30, he goes back and he deals with them. He said, now, if you will return, that is, repent, change your mind. And he restates the same vision all over again. It's not like he carries long-term memory. No. When it's over, it's over. That's the concept of reconciliation. Reconciliation literally means the slate is completely wiped clear. There's nothing else on the slate. God has no log of anyone's sins because he took it all out on Christ, on the cross. Christ was full satisfaction. He settled the debt. Talk to me, children. So it's not like God's got, you know, this board that he's writing on. Oh, yeah, they blew it yesterday. Yeah, and that remind me of when they did it uh, two weeks ago. And I'm going to put a check mark here because they didn't do it just one time. They did it two times. You know, that's kind of how we think. That it, but that's not really the way that it is. Reconcile, reconcile. It was God in Christ reconciling. It wasn't initiated by man. God in Christ reconciling. The word katalage. Whenever you see kata, it means that something came down. Hallelujah. And it was with intensity. It was with passion. It was God in his passion, his love, reconciling us. While we were yet enemies, that is when he reconciled us by his blood. Now we are being saved by his life. Hallelujah. 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 And so we don't have to worry about whether, amen, it, when, when we are in Christ, that God is filling out that board anymore. Amen. No, when he looks at you, he sees him. Yes. You know, even when, when the sacrifice was brought to the priest and presented by a person that had trespassed or sinned, the priest would take the sacrifice and he no longer looked at the person that brought the sacrifice. He just examined the sacrifice because the sacrifice stood for the person. So the sacrifice, in a sense, was substitutionary at that point and it carried everything that the presenter had done. That's what Christ did for us. He was the substitution. He carried everything that humanity had done. And God no longer was judging or praising humanity. But he looked at Christ. Christ. Hallelujah. Hebrews tells us that all things, when you look at it, it, the picture here is the, the priest. And it said that. Basically, the sacrifice was opened up from head all the way down. Yes. Then examine. 
And if there were no flaws, if there were no flaws, then it's an acceptable sacrifice. Well, when God opened him up through crucifixion, he couldn't find any flaws. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate. Hallelujah. And because he was, we at that moment, we at that moment became free because the sacrifice settled it all. And you see pictures of this in ideas like when you return. <laughs> what I had as plan A is still intact. So when we return in Christ, oh hallelujah, I almost feel like dancing here. What he had established in Genesis when he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Plan A and let them have dominion. Amen. Is still intact. Still intact. So, the foundation of what Daniel's about to see is connected to full restoration. Now, go to verse 24 because between his discovery here in verse 2. And to verse 24, he's a man that identifies with the people. And though he's a righteous man, we know that Daniel's a godly, righteous man. But yet he identifies with what has happened to his people. He doesn't set himself up above the people. He doesn't behave as though He's holy, more holy than they, more righteous than they. He identifies with them. And this is really a messianic principle in many ways, a kinsman redeemer principle. You redeem because you're kin. And what he says more or less when he's done with his praying, in verse 24, it said, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, I want you to remember the premise for all that's about to go on was the basis of the 70 years because the number 70 is prominent here. <laughs> We're going to get right back into the broadcast in a moment. But before we do, many of you have asked questions concerning the subject of covenant. Well, we have a resource that we believe will be helpful. It's entitled the Dynamic Covenant Series. And what it is, is a seven volume series of many books in which no book is larger than 65 pages. So that's going to be easy reading. Now you can go to the website and pick up the set of books there, drstepheneverett.org, and we believe that they'll be helpful. Now, let's get back into the broadcast. Keep in mind 70. He says 70 weeks are determined that is cut out upon thy people and upon thy holy city. When we taught school, we taught children, first and foremost, get the context of what you're reading. Get the context. Who's it talking about? What is it talking about? If there's a where, why, and when, answer those questions. So I'll ask you the question. Who is this talking about? 
when it speaks to Daniel and it says, thy people. Who is it talking about? The children of Israel who are currently in captivity. Now I want to tell you something. That was not you. All right? It's just like in Matthew 16, after this marvelous revelation of the church. And then before Matthew 17, Jesus says, some of you who are standing here will not see death until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. That was not you. <laughs> you were not standing there listening to him talk at that moment. But there were those who were standing there listening to him. And we know that three of them saw exactly what he said. The son of man coming in his glory. Because Matthew 17, the chapter on the transfiguration, proves exactly that. Because Peter later, when he was writing about it, 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, on that day when we saw him on the holy mount, we beheld his coming and his glory, his majesty and his glory. <laughs> Have you ever put it together? See, Peter was standing there that day. John was standing there that day. James was standing there that day. And they all saw it. The other nine, they were down to the bottom playing church. <laughs> because they were down there trying to get a devil out of a boy that they didn't have the power to get the devil out. <laughs> so we could even just go off on a trail tonight and say, well, you mean to say that there are other things that you could say is the coming other than the final? Yes. I got you thinking too hard, so I got to bring you back to simplicity. <laughs> You're thinking way too hard, all right? You see, the New Testament itself uses seven different words to describe coming, appearing, or presence of the Lord. Seven. Completeness. And so it's much larger than what we ever thought. But to make sure that we stay on track here, because I don't have time to hunt down a rabbit and kill him tonight. Who are we talking about here? Again, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. Who are we talking about? All right, and they're in captivity. And then he said, and upon thy holy city. Who was the holy city? Okay, so we know then that the foundation for what is about to be said applies to Israel and Jerusalem. Now from there, look at what he said. There's six things here. He said, this is what has been determined or cut out. Cut out for your people and for your city. Number one, the transgression is going to be finished. Number two, to make an end of sin. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. If you want to know what the word iniquity means, it is lawlessness. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, I got to stop right there and ask you, does that sound like an antichrist to you? He said, this is cut out. Daniel, for your people, for your city. 
Number five is to seal up the vision of the prophecy. Number six, to anoint the most holy. Six things that has been determined, cut out. And then if, if I look at each of these, you know what I can do? I can find Jesus in every one of them. Every last one of them. And this prophecy has been the primary prophecy that has been used to establish a futuristic concept of his coming. It is this prophecy right here. This is where it all goes. Now I'll take you one step further. When the reformers began to put so much heat on the Pope as the Antichrist, the Counter-Reformation had to find a way to get the heat off the Latin man. And so two Spanish priests came up with counter-ideas. <laughs> because as you read further, and I'll show you this, I'll, I'll show you this. He said, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. You add seven, three score, which is 60 and two, you got 69. And you will find that when you look at the commandment to rebuild and then by the time the Messiah is declared, we're looking at 400 and 83 years, 69 weeks of years. Okay, all right, let's go further. He said, here now, watch what happens when they start to restore. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Read the book of Nehemiah chapter 2 and you will see that there was great trouble, great opposition, great persecution. It wasn't just one expedition back to the land. One was led by Ezra. One was led by Nehemiah. One was led, if you will, by Zerubbabel. It was at least three expeditions to come back. Are you with me here? And so there was much pressure from the outside for them to not restore the city. Uh, Ezra had the responsibility of the temple. Nehemiah, the walls. Okay. Zerubbabel became a governor. He was called a Tershatha. That means governor. <laughs> and so what you have here in all of this is that God starts with restoration from the inside, and he moved out. It was the temple, and then he moved out to the walls. How did your restoration start? From the inside, come on. Uh-huh, and it's coming what? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why your walls shall be called salvation, and your gates praise. You see, when you're talking about temple, it, in reference to our spirit, Paul said, don't you realize that you are the temple of the living God? And that word wasn't the word that was used for outer temple. It was the word neos, which means inner temple. Don't you realize that's who you are? That's where your restoration began. Hallelujah. And it was done by a scribe that is someone that was able to write upon the tables of your heart and mind because that's where you place this covenant, this new covenant. Come on with me, children. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was trouble. So there's always persecution when that process starts. But thank God he's greater than the persecution. And the commandment that he's given will outlast the persecution. 
You may have Sambad, Sambalas, Tobias, Arabians. You may have all of those threefold resisting you. But nevertheless, what God has given as a commandment is greater than the resistance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, let, let's go just a little bit further because I want, I want you to see something. He said, and so what will happen? He said, and after three score and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off in connection with those seven, but not for himself. And then look at here, there's a shift. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who's he talking about? Is he talking about this same Messiah that he was talking about a few minutes earlier? And the answer is, it's twofold. Because Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in two days, I'll raise it up again. And they said, it took 46 years to rebuild it. They said, no, 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 that's impossible. He said, oh, no. You don't understand what I'm really talking about. But to stretch this further, there was another prince who came. And his name was Titus. And he was the son of the Roman emperor. What did he do? The temple that Jesus said would be destroyed, would be raised, that is torn down to the ground. There would not be a single stone left on top of the other. In, when you look at that generation by 70 AD, that very word was accomplished. Not a single stone was left on top of the other. God left that in order to establish the second and the second that he was establishing was that his temple no longer would be made of brick and mortar. It would no longer be made out of wood. It would no longer be made out of stone. I'm firmly establishing now. I've left that. That's all over. You have become the temple of the living God. Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, he said, don't you realize that you are the temple? In fact, you are a growing temple. Every time somebody is born again, you become a lively stone. God adds one more stone to the temple. The purpose behind this is so that God can inhabit the temple by his spirit. He provides himself residence in the earth by living and abiding in the temple. I trust that you have enjoyed the broadcast today and we're going to get into this next week again on kingdom eschatology. So remember, the kingdom of God is at hand and it is within your reach. Thank you.